Israel Finkelstein is a leading figure in the archaeology and history of ancient Israel. Over 40 years of fieldwork and research, he has helped to change the way archaeology is conducted, the Bible is interpreted, and the history of Israel is reconstructed. I sat down with Israel over several sessions to talk about how a lifetime of work has informed the story of ancient Israel. Israel, welcome back. Good to be back. We're carrying on today again with the Philistines. In the previous talk, we discussed their very early history from Egyptian textual sources and from archaeological sources of the 12th to early 10th century. Uh, we discussed the origin, the date of the arrival of these individuals, um, the course of their migrations, and so forth. We also intentionally left the biblical text for today. So let's delve a little bit deeply into the biblical version of the Philistines. Does the Bible know anything about what we talked about last time? I don't think so. There are scholars who think that the answer is positive and they describe the history of the Philistines, the biblical material on the Philistines in a sequential way. Mm. I think that uh, for many reasons, some of them we discussed in our introduction uh, conversation about you know, rules, to how to approach Bible and archaeology. I think that the, the evidence as it stands today regarding uh, dissemination of writing and scribal activity shows us that uh, the biblical material on the Philistines could not have uh, been uh, composed before the 8th century BC, the earliest. Some of the materials or many of the materials can come from the 7th century BC. So we are centuries away, four or five centuries away from the early phase of the settlement of the Philistines on the coast of Canaan. Not only that, I think that the Bible doesn't know anything about the Egyptian domination. Mm -hmm. of Canaan in the Bronze Age, in the late Bronze Age, until the late 12th century. There's no indication of Egyptian presence here in Canaan, of Egyptian administration here in Canaan. And I think that there is also no knowledge of the background of the Philistines as we know them today from archaeology and Egyptian sources, those Philistines that we are speaking about regarding the 12th and 11th centuries BC. So we need to put this aside. The Bible, I think, does not remember really the first phase of Philistine history. When does the Bible start to remember things? I think that the good way to go into this discussion is look at the biblical tradition of the five Philistine cities. Some scholars describe this as the Pentapolis, mm -hmm. the alliance of five cities. Because, for instance, in the story of King David, and King Achish of God, we have the Philistines uh, gathering their forces together and they have one king who is stronger than the others, but basically they are equal in power and they go to the battle um, uh, in the north and King David comes to the king of God uh, uh, to meet him. So this is the notion of the Bible. However, archaeology provides us with a different picture and a very interesting one. We have five Philistine cities, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod on the coast, and two inland, Gat and Ekron, in, also in the south, in the southern part of Canaan, land of Israel, in the lowlands. Uh, four of the five have been excavated thoroughly. The four except for Gaza. There were also, there, there had been some soundings at Gaza many years ago, but not a thorough excavation. Now, the excavations sh show us that there was never a situation of five or even four equal in power Philistine cities in a, given, in a certain given time, which means that we know today that in the Iron One, Ekron, for instance, was a very important city of the Philistines. And then after Ekron declined, Gat became the most important and the biggest also, archaeologically speaking, from the point of view of size, Philistine city in the, in, uh, in the inland part of Philistia. And this was the situation in the 9th century until Gat was destroyed in the late 9th century. Then Ashdod became the most important Philistine city and became really big and important and dominating the southern coastal plain. And then Ashdod was taken over by Assyria and Ekron came again to the front and became the most important city 
in Philistia. So we have these ups and downs, and there's never a situation of four or five Philistine cities equal in power. Not only that, Gath was completely destroyed in the late 9th century. And uh, after this destruction, it never came back to its previous power. And indeed, the prophetic works in the Bible, Jeremiah, for instance, Amos, they speak about four Philistine cities. They do not mention God. They know that God is not important anymore. And the Assyrian records of the days of uh, Asarchedon and Ashurbanipal, kings of Assyria, they also speak only about uh, four uh, Philistine cities, and God is not there. So why is this related to the earliest memory of the Philistines? This is related because of God, I think. Okay. Because if God was destroyed, indeed, in the late 9th century, there are memories of God as a Philistine city in the early cycle of King David in the book of Samuel, and this must have come from, this must be a memory that relates to the period before the destruction of God in the late 9th century. So the earliest memory of the Philistines in, in the Bible, I think, can be placed on, against the background of the middle of the 9th century, or the 9th century, let's put it this way. However, composition of texts describing Philistines comes a bit later, and we, we will be speaking about it. So in these earliest, relatively secure memories of the Philistines in the mid-9th century, this puts us with equal to the Omeride dynasty in Israel. Yes, the Omeride dynasty in Israel or very slightly after. All right, where does the idea of the equal power Philistine cities come from, the Pentapolis? Well, this, this really is a very interesting question, and I think that this question also will uh, introduce us to the very interesting link that we have between the memories of the Philistines in the Deuteronomistic history, in the, mainly in the books of the first and second books of uh, Samuel, and uh, this Greek atmosphere, Greek ambience uh, in the story. Uh, if the, indeed, the, as we, many of us uh, suppose, uh, the Deuteronomistic history, which means the block from Joshua through Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel to 1st and 2nd Kings, indeed was composed in the late 7th century BC in the time of King Josiah. This is the period when there are also indications uh, for presence of Greeks uh, in uh, the land of Israel. And we are speaking about a period in the late 7th century when uh, Greek uh, mercenaries served in the army of the 26th Egyptian dynasty. And so what uh, is Egypt doing again in the southern coast of Canaan? The reason is that when the Assyrians pulled out around 630 BC, the Egyptian 26th dynasty replaced them because there was this again revival in Egypt with the idea that Egypt can become again an empire which rules over large parts uh, of uh, Western Asia, of the Levant, uh, for instance. So there are soldiers that were sent from, came to serve in the Egyptian army, mercenaries, and there are possibly even indications of Greek mercenaries in the service of Judah. We will relate to it in a moment from now, I suppose. So these Greeks, could have brought with them the typical idea and the phenomenon that is well known from the coast of uh, Asia Minor, Western Asia Minor, the Ionian coast of uh, Greek leagues of cities. This was a very well phenomenon in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. So the Deuteronomistic authors could have taken this idea from the Greek tradition that came with the mercenaries in the 7th century BC. I see. So are you suggesting that the biblical understanding of the Philistines is really a picture of the land of Philistia while the Egyptians were dominant in the area who all had Greek mercenaries with them? Yes, I think that the answer is positive. And this also can explain the fact that uh, the Bible knows, so to speak, that they originated, these Philistines, from the West. Mm. 
So the Bible makes the link of Philistia, Philistines, Mediterranean background with the phenomenon of the time of the authors of Greek mercenaries serving in Philistia in the 7th century BC. So it's, it's coincidence that they're roughly correct. They didn't really know where they came from. <laughs> the Bible is always correct. <laughs> Let's spend a little bit more time on this world of the 7th century in which you are putting uh, the Philistines in contact with the Egyptians and the Greek world. Uh, are there other pieces from the Bible that talk about this connection? Yes, there are, and some of them are really fascinating. And I'm, I will keep the most fascinating uh, for the end, maybe. But let me start with the, a word which appears in the Bible regarding the Philistines and is not Semitic. And I refer now to the question of the Seranim. You know, the Seranim are the lords of the Philistines. In the Hebrew Bible, uh, in, uh, they are called Seren, Seranim. Uh, the word is not Semitic, but the word probably comes from the Greek Tyrannos, tyrant, which means autocratic ruler. And the phenomenon of tyrants is also very well known in the 7th and 6th centuries. And in fact, the first tyrant is known in Western Asia Minor in the late 7th century BC, in the 7th century BC, in the region known as uh, Lydia uh, in Western Asia Minor. And the word the Tyrannos in Greek, I just should mention, probably comes from uh, an earlier uh, non-Greek, so to speak, uh, world uh, in Asia Minor, in Anatolia. So the question is again, uh, how did this word, how did it migrate from Greece, from Asia Minor, to the Levant, to Philistia, to the land of Israel in the 7th century BC? And the answer is again that probably it came with the mercenaries. The mercenaries who came exactly from the same regions uh, of Western Asia Minor, and they came also from the background of these tyrants who ruled there uh, in their time. Uh, so here we need, I think, to dive a little bit into the sources describing the uh, fact that uh, Greek mercenaries served in the Egyptian uh, army uh, of the 26th dynasty in the 7th century BC. We know about this from several sources. There are, by the way, several textual sources. There are also archaeological sources in Egypt and in other places, including, by the way, the coast of Israel. But the uh, historical sources are interesting. First of all, Herodotus. Herodotus speaks clearly about the mercenaries being sent to serve in Egypt, and they come from Lydia and Ionia, which means Western Asia Minor. And then we have also a source uh, uh, by uh, Ashurbanipal, king of Assyria at the same time. He is uh, around the middle of the 7th century BC. Not same time of Herodotus, but same time of the coming of the mercenaries. And he speaks about mercenaries from Lydia. So we now can focus on a certain area, and this area fits well with the, the possibility of migration of the word Seren, Seranim from Asia Minor to the Levant. I wish also to add here I mean, we are, I'm using uh, throughout this conversation the intermediaries, which means the Egyptian 26 dynasties ruling, having forces in Philistia after the pullout of Assyria. And we have indication for this also archaeological uh, from several places, especially from a fort uh, on the coast uh, south of Tel Aviv, where uh, we have Egyptian, uh, we have uh, Greek pottery of the time, and we have even uh, armor scales. Uh, which uh, fits this uh, service of uh, mercenaries, Greek mercenaries in the Egyptian army. But we also have one textual evidence, a very interesting one, for the possibility there were, that there were also mercenaries in Judah, which means that the biblical authors could have known them very closely to them in Judah itself. We have the collection of Ostraka, shirts with ink inscriptions that were found about 50, 60 years ago, in the fort of Arad, in the south of Israel, in the arid zone of the eastern Beersheba Valley. About 100 of them. Several of them mention a group of uh, a unit, a military unit, 
called the Kitim. And these Kitim are understood by many of us as related one way or the other to Greeks, Sygeans, Mediterraneans, Cypriots, somewhere from there. And they could have been Greek mercenaries, Aegean mercenaries, Mediterranean mercenaries in the service of Judah, really in the time of King Josiah and the kings after him in the very late 7th century, because the Ostraka are dated around 600 BC. Right, Greek mercenaries in Judah also probably serving with the Egyptians who are controlling the land of the, the uh, Philistines, Philistia. Uh, there are some earlier references in the book of Samuel, I think, to other mercenaries with funny names, right? With King David, <laughs> That's right. you mean? Yes, yes, of course. You are uh, referring to the Keratites and the Pelatites, right, right. the elite troops, the commando, the commander troops of King David serving for him. Uh, of course, this question needs to be asked. Why? First and foremost, because we know today the situation in Judah in the 10th century BC. Judah was a small, God-forsaken place. The demography was very limited. Uh, the economy, you know, the possibilities was li were limited. There is no way to think about Greek uh, or any mercenaries, the elite troops uh, being uh, brought and paid for by a Judahite king in the 10th century BC. So this too must be some sort of retrojection from a later situation. So the Keratites and the Pelatites, uh, there is much literature about it. Uh, is there a connection between the Keratites and Crete? Uh, what is the meaning? Is there a connection between the Pelatites and the Philistines? Corruption of the, of the name. Or there is a possibility to connect the name Pelatites to uh, a name of uh, uh, Greek uh, troops, a certain type of Greek uh, soldiers uh, of the archaic uh, days and classical days. All this is on the table, but one thing, I, I, let's not go into details here. One thing is for sure, the idea of King David having elite troops, some sort of foreigners, mercenaries serving for him is a reflection of the situation of the 7th century, retrojected uh, by the authors to the time of King David. And again, we need to remember, we need to remind uh, our listeners that uh, in the late 7th century there were Greek mercenaries in the region. Biblical authors could have known them, could have seen them, and they were possibly even in Judah. So. Speaking of Kaftor, Crete, uh, this is cited as one of the origin points for the Philistines by some of the prof prophets. Yes, and this is also problematic and it shows us the back and forth situation. We said mm -hmm. also about the Keratites and the Pelatites that they could have been retrojected. So mm -hmm. here we also possibly have a retrojection from a situation in the later phases of the Iron Age to the past. And why am I saying this? Because if it, the Bible says the Philistines came from Kaftor. And Kaftor, because of the word keftu for Crete, uh, is linked with Crete. Okay, so Kaftor is Crete. Now, the Bible says that they came from Kaftor, from Crete, in the very early days. However, the association of the early Philistines of the 12th and 11th centuries BC with Crete is very problematic. It's possible to associate them with the southern coast of, uh, of uh, Anatolia, with Cyprus, even with the Greek uh, mainland, but not so much from the material culture point of view with Crete. Yet, there is a strong possibility that there were Cretan, Cretan mercenaries among the other mercenaries, among mercenaries from Western Asia Minor. We had know, for instance, that in the Hellenistic period, there was this phenomenon of Cretan mercenaries. So mm -hmm. there could have been Cretan mercenaries again in the service of the Egyptians or Judah in the southern coastal plain in the 7th century BC. And indeed, there in the Greek classical literature, there are several clues to association of Ashkelon and Gaza, two of the cities of the Philistines, with Crete and Crete culture and with Asia Minor. So this, if you wish, 
is closes this <laughs> circle, so to speak. Okay, Greek mercenaries, Judah. Uh, in one of your more famous articles, you addressed the famous Philistine Goliath and his relationship with King David in exactly the manner you've described Philistines now. Can you elaborate? Indeed, because the story of the duel between David and Goliath is extremely interesting. Uh, it may preserve early memories. Uh, there is another memory in the book of Samuel of uh, another person, not King David, who, one of the heroes of King David, who was the one who killed Goliath. So this other tradition in the Bible could have been the original one. And then we have the story of David, which is set into a, this story which must have some sort of a meaning for the readers. And we need to dive into some of the details because it also has have a Greek ambience, Greek atmosphere in it. And why am I saying this? Two obviously most important uh, features in the story are the description of the armor of Goliath, this uh, heavy soldier standing there in the field uh, challenging uh, David and the armies of Israel and the God of Israel. And the second thing is the very idea of a duel, of a, this uh, fight between two warriors which decides the fate of the battle between the big armies. There were endless attempts to find uh, parallels to the armor of Goliath in the early days, which means uh, in uh, Greece of the Mycenaean period, in Greece of the 12th century BC, let's say. And there is this famous vase that was found in Mycenae which shows uh, uh, warriors, the uh, Mycenaean warriors, and it's called the warriors vase. And the scholars said, well, here is a description in painting, in, in a picture, so to speak, of uh, warriors who can be um, uh, compared to the armor of Goliath in the biblical story. But it doesn't work because the armor is not the same. For instance, this, the, in the vase from Mycenae, the warriors are uh, protected by leather armor, and not by uh, uh, metal armor, uh, as in the biblical story. This is only one reason. All in all, when we look into the very detailed description in the Bible of the armor of Goliath, the only way to understand it is again as depicting a Greek hoplite, which means what is a hoplite? Heavy soldier. A Greek heavy soldier of the 7th and 6th centuries BC and later, by the way, of course the 5th century as well. And uh, we, uh, then we look at the Greek uh, pottery, uh, ceramic uh, paintings of the time, and some of them really show Greek hoplites, and they look like the description of the armor of Goliath in the Bible. So the stage setting again is late, and uh, apparently I always, when I read this description in the Bible, I say to myself, the author must have seen a Greek hoplite in his eyes, because he describes Goliath as a Greek hoplite in such details that he, he must have seen one. This is one thing. The second thing, no less important, is the genre, the genre of a duel. I mean, this uh, uh, reminds us uh, of the Homeric uh, stories, especially, of course, the Iliad. In the Iliad, there is this phenomenon of duel. I mean, let me mention one of them, the duel between uh, Paris and Menelaus, uh, for instance. But not only the very phenomenon of a duel, also the details of a duel. What is a duel in the Homeric language? In the Homeric language and in the Bible, we have the same pattern. The two armies face each other. Two soldiers come out. They, give, they are described in details. Then they give, they give speeches. And then they fight each other. And one prevails. And then this decides the fate of the battle. So there is a, the whole sequence of events is sort of similar in the Homeric descriptions and in the Bible. So there's this ambience, a Greek ambience, also in the story of David and Goliath. Again, I wish to say that this does not mean that there is no early memory. 
And I think that maybe even in the opening sentence describing the scene of Soho and Azeka and the Valley of Elah, in my opinion, possibly this is also some sort of an early uh, memory that comes from the early David cycle, whatever. But uh, the, the, the substance of the story uh, is late and there is stratigraphy in the story because there is even maybe later uh, layer in the story of uh, David and Goliath. So the story of David and Goliath is obviously meant to, to tell us some other story. What, I, what is the meaning there to the authors? Good question. I am a great believer in meaning in every sentence. The authors of these stories, the Deuteronomistic authors, were so clever and sophisticated and pre-planned to advance their ideology and theology that nothing is just uh, being told um, in coincidence. Mm. So I think that there is a meaning here, and the meaning is the following, in my opinion. Of course, here we are going into speculation, definitely. But my speculation is the following, that we are now in a situation of two revival uh, ideologies about to collide. Judah with the dreams of uh, re-establishing the great united monarchy, the legendary uh, united monarchy in the time of King Josiah, who is described as the new David in the biblical text. And Egypt coming the time of uh, Psammeticus and Necho, and especially Necho, and here is Egypt coming to revive the Egyptian empire's empire in the Levant. And the two are about to collide. And the people of Judah know it. So I must ask the following question. Does the author try to tell the people of Judah that, listen, here is the situation. Goliath is the symbol, as a Greek soldier, of the main elite forces, the main skeleton of the Egyptian forces in the Levant. And David coming there with the you know, uh, and, and killing Goliath, uh, not equal to him without any armor, uh, this, uh, the weak David against the strong Goliath, is a fable for what's going to happen that Judah will be able to prevail and even a memory or a reminiscence of the fact that this had already happened once, that because of the power of the God of Israel, the weak Hebrews or the weak Israelites or the weak Judahites will be able to prevail against the mighty Pharaoh. So we've looked at early Philistine history and archaeology and what we've covered today so far has re is really addressing a very late part of Philistine history. Does the biblical text provide any other information for that period in between, another gap, if you will? I suppose that the answer is positive, and it is made of two different uh, items, so to speak, factors or considerations. The first one is the memory of gut of the Philistines in the early cycle of David. We mentioned this before, and this must depict, you know, a reality uh, before the destru destruction of gut, which means a reality in the 9th century BC, before 830 BC or so. But there is another a text in the Bible which for me is very important because my ex of my excavations at Kiryat Yarim um, uh, recently. And this is the Ark narrative in the first book of Samuel. The story of the travel of the Ark from Shiloh, Shiloh in the highlands in the north, northern part of the highlands, of the central highlands, taken over by the Philistines in the battle of Ebenezer. Taken, the Ark is taken to Ashdod, then all sorts of catastrophes because of the ark happened in Ashdod. The Philistines tried to get rid of the ark, send, they sent it to Bet Shemesh. Two other Philistine cities are mentioned, but I think that these are later additions. But they sent it to Bet Shemesh and then to Kiryat Yarim, where the ark is placed in the temple of the ark at Kiryat Yarim. Looking at this story, which comes from the north, there are many reasons, archaeological, historical, to believe to suppose that it uh, was first composed in the first half of the 8th century in Israel in the days of Jeroboam II, the king of Israel. And why am I saying this? This is because of the importance of Kiryat Yarim. Kiryat Yarim was a godforsaken place, not important at all until the construction of a big compound, summit, com summit compound there, for, pro probably for the temple in the first half of the 8th century, in the early phase that we call Iron 2B. 
And also the mention of Ashdod as the most important Philistine city fits very well what we said a few uh, minutes ago about Ashdod. That Ashdod is important mainly as the most important Philistine city in the 8th century. So all these focuses uh, on the 8th century, possibly also the uh, reference to Bet Shemesh. So the Ark narrative, all this, what we described before, about 7th century writings in the time of King Josiah, this comes from the Deuteronomistic historian in Judah. But the very specific tradition of the Ark narrative is incorporated into the Deuteronomistic history, but it originates from earlier times, from the first half of the 8th century BC, as far as I understand it. So let's, let's summarize. We've been talking about Judah in the 7th century, the composition of the Deuteronomistic history, the arrival of, or the revival of the Egyptian empire uh, with the 26th dynasty and its control over Philistia, and how a majority of the Philistine stories that we all know and love, David and Goliath, for example, really fit into this context mm -hmm. of Judah being threatened by Egypt. However, the conflict between Judah and Egypt doesn't really address the Philistine issue very directly. How do we connect all of this back to Philistines? Why is Goliath Philistine? Why isn't he just Greek mercenary guy? I suppose that uh, the answer is uh, the following, that uh, we need to look at the Judahite authors in this sense that they understand uh, the Philistine cities as cooperating with the Egyptians, with the 26th dynasty. Remember, please, that the Egyptian forces were stationed in the southern coastal plain in Philistia, in the land of the Philistines. And they also are aware of the fact that Greek uh, mercenaries are serving as elite troops, and they in the, are in, the, in the Egyptian military, and they symbolize, if you wish, the power of Egypt at that time, because these are the most dangerous soldiers in the Egyptian army. But this is not enough. I think that the Judahite authors are also aware of the link being made between Greek mercenaries and Greek origin of the Philistines. And then the question is how? And the answer must come from Philistia, not from the mind of the uh, Judahite authors. And several authors, several scholars, in fact, suggested that there was some sort of a revival sentiment, a revival Greek sentiment in Philistia uh, in the 7th century BC as a result of the appearance of Greek hoplites, Greek mercenaries in the region at that time. So I think that all this should be understood as one package. Confrontation, yes, between Judah and Egypt. However, the symbol of the confrontation is, are the Greek mercenaries in uh, Philistia, that is to say in the Egyptian army in Philistia, and an understanding of some sort of a connection between these Greek mercenaries and the very far early history of the Philistines as originating from the Aegean world. This makes the, the character of the Philistines all the more interesting in this light because we essentially have to imagine uh, a people who came from the Aegean world in the 12th, 11th centuries, over time, they settled in the southwestern coastal plain. We can see archeologically that they have their unique material culture, but they assimilate more and more over time. Yes. And we know that they start to use the local language over time as well. Right. But we see in their names, like Goliath, and uh, other Philistine names, that they're retaining their Greek ancestry in some way or another. For instance, the name of the king of God. That's right. In the 7th century BC, in the Ekron inscription of the 7th century, and in the Bible. Achish, which means Ikausu, a Greek name. That's right. So after five centuries, they return to their roots. Sentiment. <laughs> their sentiment. I think so. <laughs> right. All right, Israel. Thank you very much. Until next time. Sure. I'll be happy to be back.